Jessica, thank you very, very much for inviting me to do this. It's an enormous honor. And thank you for a way too kind introduction. And um, I just want to also all of the many people who have been involved in organizing this conference and this event. One of the things that you learn after a while when you do events is a lot of people are involved and we need uh, to extend gratitude to all of them, as well as to the Musqui people on whose land we stand and uh, extend our gratitude to them for allowing us to be here. Um, and it's really, and thank you all for coming too. That's really nice to have people come when I give a talk. Um, I, I'm truly grateful and this is just a wonderful event. And of course, thanks to the Robert Ho Family Foundation as well and to the U University of British Columbia. So, um, as Jessica said, the talk is on Buddhism and nonviolence in the contemporary world. And as many of you know, who either know me or read my stuff, it's very hard for me to go far without quoting the Indigo Girls. So we're going to begin with a lyric from the Indigo Girls, as almost all of my stuff, I'm not going to sing though, don't worry. Me, this is not a fighting song. Let it be me, not a wrong for a wrong. Let it be me. If the world is night, shine my life like a light. This will not be a disinterested analysis of Buddhist doctrine. Came hold scholarly lecture. You're in the wrong place. Go join the speed daters. But an unapologetic exposition of the implications of that doctrine for ethics and political action in the contemporary world. Ethics is meant to be demanding. That's the point. It's an ideal, not a descriptive discipline. If you don't want to be challenged, now, as I say, is the time to walk out. If you do want to know what a Buddhist ethical framework demands in the contemporary world, though, it's time to fasten your seatbelts. To understand a Buddhist analysis of nonviolence in a way relevant to our contemporary life, it's first important to understand how violence manifests in the contemporary world. You've got to begin with some understanding. Second, after that, we must develop a recognizably Buddhist analysis of that violence and its causes. And the analysis that I'm going to develop for those of you who were in our session this afternoon is something that was already foreshadowed in many of our discussions. So you can think of this talk as a kind of continuation of our conversations by other means. Third, we've got to examine how a Buddhist ethical framework determines our responsibility Of a For the first task, that's the analysis, I'm going to turn to the contemporary tradition of engaged Buddhism, and in particular, the thought of the late Thich Nhat Hanh and the 14th Dalai Lama. And Sulok Shivarak is very much in the background here too, though I won't be talking about his work so directly. He's kind of always in the back of my mind when I think about engaged Buddhism. Their thought is in turn inflected by the thought of Mohandas Gandhi. And that thought incorporates both Jain and Hindu ideas. So we've got a lot of Indian ideas coming into this from different sources. For the second part, that's developing a recognizably Buddhist analysis of that violence and its causes. I'm going to return to the source, the analysis of the causes of suffering in the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. And for the third part, talking about our responsibilities as agents in the context of that violence, we're going to draw on the Bodhisattva path as articulated by Shantideva in How to Lead an Awakened Life, or Bodhicharya Avatara, and an understanding of Buddhist moral phenomenology in terms of the Brahma Viharas. And that analysis is suggested by Buddha Gosa's presentation in the Visuddhimagga. So some people in the room are going to raise their eyebrows now at the use of this, you know, the syncretic kind of use of contemporary material, Pali suttas, classical Mahayana stuff, Theravada commentarial sources, all in the same talk and all in the same argument and say, what kind of scholar are you? Not much of one. Um, I don't mind doing that. I think the universe of Buddhist ethical discourse is vast and I prefer to draw inspiration from as much of it as possible to construct a kind of non-sectarian Buddhist analysis of nonviolence that's useful to all of us. My discussion then will not be philological and exegetical. Sometimes I do that. I'm not doing that tonight. Tonight I'm fomenting revolution. Um, but it's going to be philosophical, prescriptive, and most of all, polemical. Just as Peter Singer has emphasized throughout his career that 
consequentialism, the version of morality he likes to defend, demands more from us than what makes us morally comfortable, and that ethics should make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'm going to be arguing that Buddhist ethics is more demanding than we might like it to be, but I think that's what ethics is about. So part one, engaged Buddhist analysis of structural violence. When we use the word nonviolence in English, we're usually taking ourselves to translate the Sanskrit ahimsa. And that term, as many, most recently, Jessica, have noted, is more precisely translated as non-harm or non-injury. The lexical point is really important. Violence in English, that word, connotes violation, same word, which in turn connotes a kind of deviation from the normal, from the expected or from the required. So those of you, for instance, who like to read Hume will remember Hume on the violent and the calm passions. The violent ones are the ones that take us out of the norm into something unusual. Um, the point's important. I'm sorry, himsa though, um, deriving from the root that means to strike, to hit, doesn't have that resonance. It's not about something out of the ordinary. It simply connotes injury to oneself or to another. The point is important because as we will see, much of what constitutes himsa or harm, at least right now, is often normal, expected, and even legally and socially required, despite its morally problematic status. An important contribution of the engaged Buddhist movement is the direction of our attention to the normalization of harm. And that's what really upsets me when I think about this. It's not the pervasiveness of harm, it's the normalization of harm. Um, that, I, that I really want to draw attention to. Or what we have come to call violence, even though it's not a violation anymore, it's just the norm in everyday life. And we need to talk about the need for radical change if we're going to lead individually or collectively lives of ahimsa or non-harm or non-violence. So when I use the English non-violence, hear through that and hear ahimsa, non-harm. Thich Nhat Hanh, introduced to Buddhist thought the idea of structural violence. Structural violence is not constituted by the act of any specific individual, but by social, political, and economic structures that institute, constitute, and perpetuate large-scale harm. So today we've spent a lot of time in our meetings talking about factory farming and the capitalist institutions that maintain that. That's structural violence. It's not about what one person is doing in a slaughterhouse somewhere. It's about the system. To be sure, these structures are in part themselves constituted by individual actions, but they're not reducible to them. They often provide the context in which those actions have the meaning and significance that they do. So without the context, you can't even get the actions. It's not like you get the actions first and then build it up. So for instance, um, while a misogynist workplace might be constituted in part by the actions of individual managers and workers. Are there misogynist workplaces in Canada? Probably not, right? <laughs> in America. Um, it also makes it the case that what might otherwise be a friendly greeting, like for instance, you look great today, instead a case of sexual harassment. These structures hence determine as well as reflect certain kinds of agency. They make certain kinds of communication possible, certain kinds of communication impossible, certain kinds of actions possible, certain kinds of actions impossible. To remediate the harm that such a remark causes requires not simply the change of the behavior of an individual, but the change of the culture that gives that behavior its meaning and that perpetuates harms of that kind. Engaged Buddhist scholars like Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, and Silak Shivarak inspired not only by classical Buddhist social thought, such as that in Nagarjuna's Ratnavali, but also by Gandhi's analysis of the violence of modernity in Hind Swaraj, have emphasized that the contemporary world is marked not only by pervasive acts of individual violence, but also by structural violence that transcends, enables, and occludes the harm caused by those individual acts. I wanna emphasize that. Structural violence doesn't only Allow, allow violence to occur, doesn't always provi only provide the context for that violence and the significance of that violence. It also includes it and covers it up and makes it look like it's perfectly normal behavior. So when we think about the two meanings of subverting, right? Convention and covering up, 
structural violence is uh, Samvirti in spades. Um, and I also, I guess I want to emphasize, if you haven't read Hind Swaraj recently, read Hind Swaraj. Um, it's a really fascinating um, analysis of modernity and the pervasiveness of structural violence in modernity. Structural violence transcends, um, transcends those individual harms because it causes harms that go beyond those caused by individual acts. Those structures continue to harm even when no individual is doing anything harmful. They harm just by their very presence and by the threat that they pose and by the way they organize our social life. It enables them because it perpetuates the circumstances in which harmful acts are inevitable. And it occludes them because it normalizes acts so that we cease to see them as harmful and even sometimes regard them as morally salutary. To achieve nonviolence, requires not only then the transformation of our individual behavior, that's important, but that's not enough, but the dismantling of these violent social structures. This is a big ask, but as I said, morality often asks a lot of us. Now we're gonna get political. We live in a world and I live in a nation state, that is the place south of here, saturated with structural violence. The version of uncontrolled capitalism that we endorse in the place where I come from is violent through and through. Jeff Bezos earns over 6,000 times the median salary of his employees. I wanna say that again, over 6,000 times the median salary, not the lowest salary of his employees. Unemployment is tolerated as a means to suppress wages in order to maximize the income of shareholders in corporations. I'm not making this up. Energy companies, this would never happen in Canada, to spoil the environment, contribute to climate change <laughs> while corrupting politicians to gain support for their, for their violent activities. And that corruption is part of the structure that enables, gives meaning to, and occludes that violence. Investment banks prey upon the vulnerable in order to generate astronomical profits for wealthy partners and clients. Right now, suing the federal government for forgiving student loans because the investment bankers won't get rich enough. The unjustifiable gap between the very rich and the middle class and the equally unjustifiable gap between the middle class and the world's poor continues to grow year by year. We tolerate famine when there's plenty in the world. We tolerate untold suffering to millions of animals in factory farms and in environments that are being despoiled and to the planet in order to feed our population in an inefficient manner. All of this is structural violence. That's what structural violence looks like. Jackson versus Dobbs is structural violence. Citizens United for the Canadians around here. These are just horrific Supreme Court cases in our recent past. Citizens United is structural violence. Systematic racism in our economy, our schools, our policing, our judicial system is structural violence. The pervasiveness of implicit bias, not only among white people, but among black people demonstrates the pervasive and corrosive power of this violence. It's a structural violence that gets into each of our heads, whether we want it there to be there explicitly or not, whether we're on the side of the oppressor or the side of the oppressed. The denial of access to healthcare to vast swaths of the population of the world is structural violence. Denial of voting rights is structural violence. Educational inequality is structural violence. A taxation system that exempts the wealthy from paying their share while burdening the poor is structural violence. In each of these cases, we find social, I'm not making this stuff up by the way, this is actually true. Um, we find social, political, or economic institutions that uncontroversially create massive harms to many for the benefit of a small class of the rich and powerful and cause widespread damage to our world for the benefit of a few who can insulate themselves from that damage. And we are taught to accept the situation. Whatever you think about the desirability of these arrangements, the facts I've just retailed are absolutely beyond dispute. Once again, where there might be some actions on the part of identifiable individuals that are instrumental to this network of violence, 
The real damage isn't done by those individual actions. It's done by the structures created by those actions that in turn legitimize, enable, and encourage more of the same. That is what violence or himsa looks like in the contemporary world. And we cannot, in good conscience, turn away from it, for it is just as obviously wrong as it is normal. Now let's turn from politics to Buddhism, and in particular to the four ennobling truths. The first point to make is that the structural violence that I've been talking about is dukkha, or suffering. And it's dukkha in all of the three canonical senses of that term. First, it is evident suffering, the routine pain, distress, and death caused by the ills that consumer capitalism and oligarchic rule cause are too numerous and too obvious to need enumeration. But to remind ourselves, just in case you forgot what they are, they include poverty, illness, premature death, drug dependency, criminal lives, lives destroyed by criminals, despair, destruction of self-respect, and the list goes on and on. I'm sure you could add a few to that. Second, this structural violence is the suffering of change. It's not only evident suffering, it's that next level. It creates circumstances of uncertainty for those it harms, threatening further slides down socioeconomic ladders, making any gains insecure, making it impossible to plan for the future. Time becomes an implacable enemy in such circumstances. And finally, and most obviously, it instantiates what is otherwise always the hardest kind of suffering to see. I mean, look, usually when any of us teach the three levels of suffering, evident suffering, the suffering of change, and the suffering of pervasive conditioning, we always think the first two are really easy to see, and that third one's really hard, and you've got to tell a hard, complicated story to make it clear to students, not in this case, not in this case. The systems of structural violence we, we have been discussing are totalizing. They define virtually every aspect of our lives and they are inescapable. Nearly everything we do from purchasing our food to seeking a job implicates us in some way in oppressive political and economic structures, exploitative economic structures or destructive structures of social domination. The fact that whether we support them or not, we're constantly implicated in them is the predicament referred to canonically as the suffering of pervasive conditioning. You can't get out of that web of conditions that's a constant cause of suffering. If that's the fact that most of what constitutes our lives is determined by forces outside of our control. That's the first noble truth. Second truth, that of the causes of dukkha, attraction and aversion grounded in primal confusion. First, attraction. The frameworks we've been considering are both grounded in attraction and organized so as to generate and to perpetuate that attraction. That's what advertising is all about. It's an attraction creation machine, right? The Tibetan scholar Sogyal Rinpoche noted this fact when he compared capitalism to offering a glass of salt water to a thirsty man. Advertising generates a desire for products. The desire for wealth and power motivates corporate greed. The desire for power and prestige motivates social inequality. In each case, the harms we identify are not only created by the relevant desire, but they serve to replicate it. Just how much more wealth do you think Elon Musk needs? How comfortable is the privileged white person when the demands of his black neighbor threaten his position of privilege? Which politician or manager is satisfied that she now has just enough power and doesn't need any more? Aversion is also constantly operative. The antipathies to one another created by division and inequality the fear of harm in which so many are forced to live help to fuel the very structures that elicit them. And I would just come back right now to, um, uh, to Becker's beautiful theory of terror management. The idea that, we, uh, that most, much of our pathology and much of our social pathology is caused by social structures that keep us in a constant state of terror and end up with us spending most of our time trying to figure out how to manage that terror. People aren't at their best when they're terrified, by the way. But we've managed to create a social structure where most of us are afraid most of the time. For those who succeed, there's always the fear of loss of position or falling back in the worst case. And the fear that those who cost their success, at whose cost their success is achieved, 
will rise up against them. That's where we find all these gated communities. Talking about a revolution may, as Tracy Chapman sings, sound like a whisper, but it's a whisper that never allows the rich and powerful to sleep well at night. Hence their gated communities, their private planes, their security apparatus. That stuff is not the signal of happiness. You don't build that stuff because you're happy. You build it because you're scared out of your mind. And as the Buddha taught at Sarnath, attraction and aversion are grounded in primal confusion. Canonically, that's confusion about the fundamental nature of reality, including taking impermanent things to be permanent, taking merely conventionally existent phenomena to be intrinsically real, taking interdependent phenomena to be independent, taking what lacks a self to have a self, taking what's a source of suffering to be a source of happiness. We need to do very little to transpose these canonical descriptions of primal confusion to the present case. Systems of structural violence are maintained in part by the fact that those who participate in them take them to be part of an immutable nature of society, that there's nothing you can do about them, that that's just the way the world has to be. Proposals for change, especially for <clears throat> radical change, are simply dismissed as naive as not understanding the nature of economics, or not understanding real politics, or not understanding what's possible, et cetera. I expect that that's how many people are gonna receive this talk. Um, a just kind of naive, goofy talk by a 1960s uh, ex-hippie. Permanence is taken for granted. In the same vein, buttressed by social science and the interests of the powerful, the institutions are taken to be simply natural not established by human conventions, just the way the world is, intrinsically, not conventionally real. Structural violence often leads those of us who are its victims to see our own predicaments in isolation, to see the actions of others in isolation, and so to ascribe a kind of autonomy and independence where there is in fact interdependence. And that's really important because then what happens is we decide that the only way that we can solve these problems and that, and that the way to solve these problems is by our own individual actions. If I just recycle this can, everything will be cool. Um, and we don't recognize that as long as the structures are there that perpetuate the violence, all the individual action in the world doesn't mean squat. This is part of what Marx called false consciousness. And this taking of agents who are interdependent and selfless to be autonomous and independent actors obfuscates and hence perpetuates the structure of these violent systems. And finally, all of these systems sell themselves to us as the only guarantors of such goods as political freedom, safety, prosperity, and so forth, touting their value as sources of real happiness. When in fact, as we've seen, they are simply mechanisms for the reproduction of widespread suffering. The second of the four truths applies in this case as surely as it does, as does the first. All of this comports with the Buddhist location of right view at the beginning of the Eightfold Path to Liberation. Since the entire mechanism of structural violence has its grounds in attraction and aversion arising from fundamental confusion, the first step to undoing this mass of suffering is understanding. Only if we see clearly how suffering arises from these complex social structures, and only if we see through the fog of false consciousness that they induce, can we move effectively to undo them. This analysis is the gift of the engaged Buddhist movement, and it calls us to action, a call that in Buddhist terms is the call to the bodhisattva path. And that's to the topic to which we now turn. So I now want to talk to you about the Bodhisattva path in the 21st century. This is the second part of the paper. The path metaphor structures Buddhist ethical thought from the very beginning and in all traditions. We begin with the Eightfold Path, add the path of purification, the Bodhisattva path, the Tantric path. We get a lot of paths. Here I choose to follow the Bodhisattva path in explicating a contemporary Buddhist engagement with structural violence for several reasons. First, I think that Shantideva offers the most sophisticated exposition of Buddhist ethics in the canonical literature. That point's debatable. Some of my friends prefer Buddhaghosa. But I think on the whole, Shantideva takes many of Buddhaghosa's insights and runs just a little farther with them. Second, most of the principal theorists of engaged Buddhism work within the Mahayana tradition 
and they rely on Shanti Deva's analysis. Third, Shanti Deva's analysis, more than any other, connects the moral phenomenology of Buddhist ethics to a program of action for the benefit of others. It's instructive that Shanti Deva's analysis of samsara begins with fear and its connection to vice and suffering. He argues in the first two chapters of Bodhicharya Avatara that most vice arises from fear. And he suggests that the fear of death lies at the root of our primal confusion and self-grasping that conditions suffering. The Bodhisattva path is the path from fear to confidence, as well as a path to benefiting others. Once we focus on structural violence, we see that Shanti Deva's lesson applies here as well. So many of the oppressive systems that generate this kind of violence are maintained by pervasive fear. Fear of unemployment, fear of poverty, fear of lack of access to health care, fear of physical violence. A significant step in addressing structural violence is therefore forging the solidarity that allows us to step out of fear into confidence that we can make a difference. Let's see how the cultivation of each of the six perfections on the Bodhisattva path addresses structural violence. Each does so at the individual and at the systemic level. The first perfection on that path is the perfection of generosity. Usually understood in the Mahayana tradition as threefold, comprising the giving of material support, of teaching, and of shelter from harm. At the individual level, the cultivation of generosity begins the process of decentering the self and of self-interest and of developing a commitment to act for mutual benefit. By the way, one of the best people on this is Peter Kropotkin um, in The Conquest of Bread. So if you haven't read good anarcho-syndicalist literature out of Russia recently, after you finish in Swaraj, start reading anarcho-syndicalist literature. These guys knew what they were doing. Um, this is just advertising. Um, okay. Um, uh, yeah. These are the attitudes necessary to become an agent for solidarity and for the dismantling of structural violence. At the systemic level, cultivating generosity entails revisioning institutions as mechanisms for promoting the general good rather than as devices for concentrating power and wealth, constraining the accumulation of obscene individual wealth, redistributing goods and services so as to alleviate poverty and suffering and so forth. All goals which are directly achievable and which are blocked simply by taking greed and self-interest rather than generosity as default, rational, acceptable motivations. So when microeconomics defined rationality as the disinterested pursuit of my own individual self-interest, I just want to vomit and say so much the worse for the entire damned discipline. The second perfection to be cultivated on the Bodhisattva path is the union of recollection and introspective vigilance, often translated as mindfulness, a term that I now hate to use because of the set of residences that it's acquired in the contemporary mindfulness industry. At this stage, we focus on recollecting and keeping in mind our values and commitments and on mobilizing these to motivate action and to evaluate policy. It's one thing to endorse salutary moral principles and to aspire to personal and social transformation. It's another for those commitments to remain front and center in our consciousness and to drive our actions and our attitudes. When we imagine the social structures we endorse, those are structures that encourage these attitudes rather than those that celebrate egoism and competition, that encourage us to remain aware of our responsibilities and not to be distracted by bread and circus. The final perfections on the list are individual in character, but instrumental to addressing structural violence. One of the most difficult and important qualities to cultivate, and the next on the path, is that of patience. Patience is posed as the antidote to anger. And anger these days is often regarded as an appropriate response to injustice and to injury. And there's a lot of good philosophers um, who argue that anger is a necessary and a valuable emotion. I disagree. A popular bumper sticker reads, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. I like that when you put anger and mindfulness together in that kind of order. Um, and several influential contemporary philosophers valorize anger as the only appropriate way to show solidarity with the oppressed and to show self-respect when one, oneself is oppressed. 
Shanti Deva famously disagrees, and anger is always regarded as a pathology or a klesha in Buddhist moral psychology. There are good reasons for this. Anger clouds our judgment. It makes us less effective agents and collaborators. It causes harm to ourselves and to others. And it reflects, sorry, Rick, a distorted view of agency. Um, the latter is particularly apposite in the context of structural violence. <clears throat> Anger typically directs our moral attention to individuals, not to institutions. Mm -hmm. Anger is a great way. You find out who you're angry at, you find this person, right? Um, when we do that, we attribute original agent causation to these targets, and that distracts us from the role of into institutions and structures in constituting that violence. And so it maintains this occlusion, and it frames the, it, uh, the actions to which we respond. It, it fails to frame them in that context. And that reduces our own effectiveness as agents. The cultivation of patience is hence necessary if we're to be effective Buddhist revolutionaries. The fourth perfection is that of commitment. It turns out that both that maintaining the other perfections and undoing the social systems that encode massive structural violence isn't easy. Who knew? None of this work will be completed in our lifetimes. Just as Shantideva thought that the project of awakening for the benefit of all beings as a project of many lifetimes. It's important to believe in the future if you're going to be an agent. You don't need to believe in your own future, but you've got to believe there's a future worth fighting for. If you don't believe there's a future, there's no motivation. Without cultivating the commitment that turns the cultivation of perfections and the transformation of the social order into a lifelong project, everything is just wasted effort. I mean, we're not playing for small change right now. We're not playing for small change. We're playing for the survival of the planet. We're playing for the survival of the human race and for other animals. We're playing for a society that's worth living in. And that's a big project. And if you don't care about that project, that's fine. But if you care about it, this level of commitment at, uh, at the seventh, at the, at the, in, in the seventh chapter is really important. Okay, like, all, like the builders of medieval cathedrals, we've got to be motivated by a task that others will complete in the future. The perfection of meditation might seem optional in a project of social transformation. But if we attend to the role of meditation in the canonical bodhisattva path, we see that it's in fact essential. Meditation is the process by means of which conceptual understanding is internalized as a perceptual set. And I want to emphasize that because this is a Buddhist project, what we're really aiming at doing is transforming the way that people see the world. We're trying to transform experience. We're trying to recruit the moral imagination and, the mor and moral habits. That's what Buddhism brings to the table. That's what's distinctive about where we're coming from. To become generous, for instance, is not simply a matter of knowing what's good to give or even of giving. Instead, it's to experience others as affordances for that generosity and to experience one's possessions and skills as means to others' benefits. It's to cease experiencing one's possessions, time, and effort as one's own and to experience oneself as an interdependent member of a community. In the context of an engaged Buddhist response to structural violence, meditative practice is aimed at transforming one's knowledge of the systematic character of the violence against which one struggles into the perception of those systems as the target of one's action. A coming to experience the world in terms of these complex structures, instead of a perception of isolated individual actors from which one infers the existence of those structures, and so of allowing a deeper spontaneity and focus of action. The final perfection on the bodhisattva path is the perfection of wisdom or insight. No political action against structural violence, no matter how well motivated, can be effective without insight into the systems that perpetuate it, into the motivations of those who perpetuate it, and who, of those who are victimized by it, and into one's own psychology as an actor. Just as primal confusion is the root of all suffering, including of the root of this pervasive system of suffering, the insight that eliminates that confusion is essential to extirpate that root. Now part three, moral transformation for nonviolence. The Bodhisattva path hence provides a roadmap for a radical program of personal and social transformation. And I mean this to be radical. And Shantideva is an ally for contemporary engaged Buddhism. But if we're looking for an account of the moral psychology of the engaged Buddhist agent, we can no do no better than to turn to Buddhaghosa, 
account of the Brahma Viharas or the divine states as a sketch of that desideratum. When we do so once again, we can allow ourselves to read those states both individually and institutionally. My tree or friendliness is the first of these four. By pursuing the engaged bodhisattva path, we make ourselves good friends to others, allies in the struggle against structural violence rather than unwillingly complicit agents in it. But we're also called upon to develop new social structures, social structures that themselves are friendly to and that encourage friendship among our fellow citizens. That is, we can understand our social goals as well as our personal development in terms of Maitri. Instead of institutions that create division, inequality and insecurity, widespread poverty, we can develop social arrangements that are aimed at the general good. Karana or care allows us to see the suffering of others as itself a motivation for action. Displacing our own suffering is the only motivator for the relief of pain. This state of character, like my tree, reflects a decentering of ourselves in the moral universe and the perception of an isotropic moral landscape in which everyone's happiness and suffering counts and serves as motivating. But it's also, like my tree, an institutional goal. The goal, the social change that engaged Buddhism demands is the construction of an economic, health, and political system that cares for all individuals and that does not allow many to suffer so that a few billionaires can prosper. Anarcho-syndicalists, Marxists, and the Occupy movements have all seen this necessity as well. But engaged Buddhism gives us a theoretical grounding for this revolutionary goal. Mudita, or sympathetic joy, complements these two. It constitutes an effective and per, uh, affective and perceptual set in which the success of others is a cause for rejoicing, not for competition. It stands against egocentricity and it encourages the development of institutions that facilitate the success of all. And the final Brahma Vihara, the cake show, impartiality, contrasts not only with selfishness, but with clannish or jingoistic partiality. So earlier today, I was talking about nationalism, something that some people see as you know, a great virtue and something to be extolled. And I kind of agree with Buddha Gosa, that's the near enemy. Um, right here. That's the near enemy of friendship. Um, we need a greater solidarity than nationalism can ever provide. Uh, nationalism just is an obstacle, not, not a benefit. At this point. Um, it's this impartiality that, ins that ensures that our engaged action is undertaken on behalf of all. Institutionally, we're called upon to replace violent structures that benefit some but not others with those aimed impartially at the benefit of all. Together, just as the Brahma Vihara is traditionally conceived, describe a moral perception in which we come to inhabit a centralist domain of interconnected agents. This experience is opposed to one in which we inhabit the center pole, in which we take our own narrow self-interest to be at least prima facie motivating and justificative of our actions. That's the view of economics, right? There's a reason it's called the dismal science. Um, and, in the, and in which the degree to which others and their interests matter is directly proportional to their proximity on some relevant dimension to us. That's a vision that is difficult to reflectively endorse as it is natural to occupy. When you think about the kind of ordinary moral um, perspective that we're encouraged to develop in most of our societies, where I care first about my family and friends, and then about the people kind of outside and the people outside that, and I'm just sitting here at the center pole of the universe. And you try to figure out how you would justify that to somebody. It's absolutely freaking nuts, right? Except that it's also the most natural way to think about the moral universe that there is. And it's the one that modern uh, societies encourage. Um, the goal of Buddhist moral cultivation is the spontaneous occupancy of this vision, this isotropic vision bringing our experience in line with our reflective understanding of our legitimate place in the world and of our interdependence with others. This analysis through the lens of engaged Buddhism shows us that the Brahma Viharas have a social face as well. Just as we individually abandon the center pole view for a homogenous landscape that facilitates responsiveness to others, we're called upon to rebuild our social institutions in a way that constructs that landscape one in which there is no center to which all benefits flow. 
um, in the midst of a vast periphery that's thereby disadvantaged. We can conceive of that future. We can see its desirability, just as we can conceive of our own future moral maturity and its desirability. This also suggests a broadening of our sense of social justice and of what social justice is. It asks us to think about social justice, not simply in terms of the extension of equal rights to all. I'm so glad you remembered that paper. I just, I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about the paper when I wrote this, but it shows that my thinking hasn't changed at all, um, which means I'm static and I'm just boring, right? But anyway, but thanks for that. Not simply in terms of a more equitable distribution of resources, though to be sure, these are important constituents of true social justice. Instead, though, we should think of social justice in terms of the teleology of social institutions. What are they for? We can think of them not as vehicles to the more efficient exploitation of resources, not as vehicles for profit maximization or wealth concentration, not as the means to defend some against the predations of others, but rather as dedicated to collective welfare, to the alleviation of suffering per se, and to the facilitation of moral community among persons. Some last part, very short, some final thoughts. I am conscious that all of this sounds like the ravings of an idealist hippie from the 60s. And that kind of is what it is, right? I mean, that's who I am. Um, so I've not, I really haven't outgrown that sensibility. But the fact that it's idealistic raving doesn't mean that it's wrong, okay? So I'll grant that it's idealistic raving. I'll grant that I never grew out of my 60s hippie youth. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, it is morally and politically radical. But Siddhartha Gautama, who is a prototype idealistic hippie, was radical too. And the metaphysical and ethical program he inaugurated was radical. My point here is that it continues to be radical today. That Buddhism, if you understand what it is, is radical. You can't find a kind of boring conservative Buddhism. Because if, I mean, you take the, the slogan that Thich Nhat Hanh had always, if it's not engaged, it's not Buddhism. I want to say if it's not radical, it's not Buddhism. Buddhism wasn't about tweaking around the edges of our conceptual scheme. Um, my point here is that it continues to be radical today and that the engaged Buddhist movement that I've been discussing reflects that radicalism. We can tame Buddhism. We can pretend that it's politically neutral, that it's a renunciant tradition with nothing to say about the real world. But that would be to deny both its clear ethical implications and the history of Buddhist philosophy itself. The Buddhist institution of a large Shramanic order was already socially radical, as was his rejection of caste, as was his decision to ordain women. The political philosophy articulated by Nagarjuna in Ratnavali, encouraging a vast social welfare apparatus in an Indian kingdom, including not only things that we really want today, like universal free barbers and healthcare, but also the regular feeding of ants was radical. Try to get that one through the Canadian Parliament, right? Um, we got to feed the ants. Um, and the present Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat, like Thich Nhat Hanh each remind us that if we really bring our Buddhist moral principles into our lives, and especially to our collective political lives, those principles demand radical change. Tame Buddhism, to relegate it to the temple or the monastery or the nunnery, is to betray it. The only serious Buddhism is radical Buddhism, and radical Buddhism is demanding. All of this reminds me of the words of my favorite American philosopher of the 1960s. Jane Fonda famously said, revolution is an act of love. We might also put it this way, the cultivation of my tree is a revolutionary act. So I conclude as I began with the great minstrels of engaged Buddhism, the indigo girls from the same song. In the kind word you speak and in the turn of the cheek, when your vision stays clear in the face of your fear, then you see the turning out a light switch is their only power when we stand like spotlights in a mighty time. Thank you.